Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Here we are again. Phil, now, hello, now we're back. How are we doing in our ratings around the world? Oh, goodness. Yeah, I haven't looked at the charts uh, this week. Um, I think it'll be next week when whatever we're doing now pops up. But the right. the Andrew Morton program is doing really well. It's like overtaken loads of the ones we've done recently uh, in terms of the, the the people on YouTube. You know, more than that really interesting conversation with Randy Tarabarelli, for example. Gosh. More even than than things like that great Andy Verity program. I think people really. Gosh, well, it shows there's a lot of interest in raw stories, and I suppose he is one of the great experts. So that's not surprising. I mean. You know, clearly we're going to do our little series of royal stories and, and, and maybe we go on to something else, but, you know, keep coming back because clearly there's a lot of interest. Well, actually, I love um, the comments. I've got a few more comments lined up. This is from the um, from last week's programme. Um, I can't pronounce some people's names on <laughs> on these sites. Jajumba. Five six eight four. I disagree with Andrew Morton. I think Megxit was really about how badly they both acted and their total inability to tackle any kind of work. Okay, that's what that's a view. Oh, I like Jay Taylor. The only thing I don't like about this program is when it ends. Isn't that nice? Thank you. Oh, Jay. that's a nice thing. <laughs> like Thank you. We like that. Um, and Catherine Oscar from Germany is watching our program. Several of them, I think. Saying, I really enjoyed both of your books as well, Andrew. That's you. I was oh, happy you. and surprised to come across your podcast. Thanks for what you do. Much thanks from Germany. Isn't that nice? Oh, great. Oh, well, it's very gratifying to feel that people are interested in what we we find interesting. Well, it's funny. The, the show's kind of echo through my lives now. I, um, I think partly because of your help, Andrew, I was asked to do a, a session last week at the wonderful Cuckfield Literary Festival. Yes, well, I thought you would be good. That was more Andy Verity, wasn't it? Yes, well, that's right. Andy Verity, who we interviewed on the great uh, LIBOR scandal, I got to interview him in front of quite a big crowd in the beautiful Sussex, which was fascinating, actually. Um, so, yeah, we love podcasting. We love it so much. Um, but next week, I think you're going to put me on the spot. Um, I'll let the viewers and the listeners into a secret. I, a bit reluctant to do next week's program, but I've decided to go outside my comfort zone. Perhaps you should explain what we're going to do. Well, I think one of the big things that keeps keeps coming up, and, and I mean the books on the subject have done really well, is the question of of Diana's death. And clearly, you know, there have been several um, investigations which have ruled that it was all down to Henri being drunk and it was all an accident. And I think that's your line, and that these conspiracies really can't happen. How could you cover up a conspiracy that large? And how could you arrange it when the events of that day were so disorganized? But I think it is a legitimate thing for us to look at. And I've been reading a book by John Morgan, which um, uh, I hope you'll have a chance to read too. I'm going to give you a copy. Uh, and it does raise a lot of questions. Um, whether uh, Diana was murdered or not, uh, I think clearly the way that the case was was the, the, covered um, and the inquests and, and the testimonies uh, are often very inconsistent and don't add up. I mean, I made a couple of notes here. Um, this is a little warm up for what we've got next week. But um, though the French and Scotland Yard inquiry said it was Paul Henri, the inquest by Lord Justice Scott Baker concluded that she was unlawfully killed by grossly negligent driving of the following vehicles. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff. I'm just looking again at some notes. Um, you know, the delays in getting her to hospital, the fact they passed hospitals uh, and didn't take her in. Um, well, look, uh, I, I think it's uh, that's why we have a podcast. We want to talk to interesting people about interesting things. Hopefully people will want to hear, hear that conversation. I, I mean, I'm rather sceptical. I have written a biography of Diana. Um, I looked into this, but it was 20 years ago. Um, worked with my friend Martin Gregory, who wrote a book um, explaining why it wasn't a conspiracy. But, you know, there's always a new book and there's always a new conversation. That's why we're exactly. here. Exactly. And I think, you know, that we go to places others may not want to go to. The fact that a lot of historians have just, you know, said that the, there isn't a case to answer means, well, let's have a look. Is there a case we to answer? We will do that. We'll do that next week. And do you know what? 
we've, we're chatting so much about how wonderful our podcast is. We haven't told anybody what this week's is what it's about. <laughs> well, it's pretty wonderful too, I think it's going to be. And as someone that most people will never have heard of, I, I think, you know, it's not, you know, Andrew Mortons and the others have appeared in other programs, but Di Davis, who was uh, head of Royal Security, a um, uh, very distinguished figure, is going oh, to I'm tell gonna, us a little bit about his career. We're going to do a first on the inter- I need to answer the door, but I don't want to cancel our recording. So keep talking. Well, I mean, Di Davis is is now does a lot of lecturing, and one of his subjects is assassinations um, in the or attempted assassinations against the royal family. So, I think we're going to get a lot of new information uh, about the royal family from a very different perspective, and someone who worked for the royals for a long time, delivery, uh, and is very open um, uh, to to or very uh, uh, open to talking about uh, his career. So I think um, this could be a very interesting session, uh, a very diff- slightly different session. How but he's always been very fortunate. Because I, I don't think people in that royal protection business, they talk very much, do they? They don't. I mean, Ken Wharf has written a book, um, but you know he had the overall control of the security for all the family. He changed it. I mean, he clearly kept them safe, uh, though I think there were a, a couple of pretty na- narrow squeaks. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him. And he's been a great uh, su- uh, support to me in some of my cases, particularly in my attempt to get hold of a 1932 protection file for the Duke of Windsor. So um, I think this could be a pretty special... Um, no, I'm, looking, I'm actually looking forward to it. And also, I think, given your t- the troubles you're having getting any information about Prince Andrew, and especially about his trips, who he was with on these supposedly... Um, patriotic trade missions. What did he really do, and what money maybe changed hands around those missions? I mean, it'd be quite interesting to know, wouldn't it, from Di whether he would have been accompanied. I mean, he's a member of the royal family; he's a target. Well, he, yes, you. I mean, you know, Andrew would have had uh, at least one protection officer. I mean, I know that they did recce for these trips, so uh, absolutely. But I think you know, this is one of the. Uh, I know there's one case where a protection officer asked for under data protection rules his logs. For the day when Andrew met Jeffrey, uh, and, and which he argues would show he went back to Buckingham Palace that night, uh, and the logs were destroyed. So um, you know this is the problem. Yeah. A lot of the material just isn't uh, why there. Why is it every story you try to investigate it comes down to records being withheld or destroyed? Just, there's a bit of a pattern here, isn't there? There is. Uh, yes, I know. Well, I mean, maybe it's just you. It may be me. It's just I'm just very unlucky. It's always it, the files always that are sensitive get asbestos or damp. Well, I had another case this week. I, I so many of the files that I asked for from the Metro Police, they said were lost, and I thought this is extraordinary. So I wrote and said, "How many? Uh, can you tell me how many were lost between a certain period, six month in a six month period?" And they said it would take them so long to look for this material that they couldn't even do it for a month at a time. So, because of their inefficiencies in their in their uh, retrieval system, they're basically off the off the hook in terms of having to look for lost files, which is often an excuse they use. But it's kind of worrying. They're meant to to keep these files for us uh, for posterity by law, and they're losing them. And where are they losing them? How much? We don't how? know. They don't know. Um, the Foreign Office. I I asked them for a list of of um, all the files they destroyed. They destroy about ninety percent. Uh, and they said they don't even have a list themselves, so they don't even know what they're destroying. They claim. So this is part of the the the, the, the extraordinary Alice in Wonderland of of uh, records management. Fascinating. Well, look, thank you very much for talking while I gave the uh, the viewers and any listeners who uh, a guided <laughs> tour of your house, a guided tour of my rather <laughs> untidy house. But <laughs> shall we go and talk to Di about royal protection? Yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Here we go. Well, Di Davis, we're delighted to have you, I mean, speaking very much as an insider about royal events. And can you tell us a little bit about your background I mean, in terms of your policing career? Well, I joined in the late 60s um, as a very young man, and I spent most of my uh, career as a street cop. Uh, I went from one rank to another, a great deal of it uh, in plain clothes. I was a vice cop, undercover op. So it's been frontline coppering, which is rare these days. Uh, and I think, sadly, because that's where you learn your profession or your trade, uh, is by learning the hard way, occasionally making mistakes, but commanding, you know, various things from football matches to, to Notting Hill Carnival 
people and what have you. It's where you learn to act quickly and succinctly. Was the new appointment to the Royal Protection quite surprising, given that background? Well, yes, it's like putting Dracula in charge of a blood bank, somebody said. Um, yes, but what they it needed a good, uh, I think it needed change. And I was, uh, you know, known for, you know, getting things done, if you like. And what year I, was this, Di, when you started working with the Royals? What year was it? Uh, well, I was selected in 94. And, and uh, you know, one of the first things I did was rewrite the, the uh, document. In, in other words, prioritising what I felt was my vision and indeed what should be the vision for protecting the royal family, starting with Her Majesty the Queen and then cascading down, as it were. And, of course, we had all the palaces, castles, Buckingham Palace, obviously, St. James's, Kensington, and then the Scottish ones as well. And, indeed, um, when they went abroad, we went with them, or my officers That's did. a big so job. A how, how many people were working to you at any one time? About four to five hundred, I seem to recall. Um, wow. But the part of a one and a half thousand, really, uh, in terms of the royalty and diplomatic. And, of course, you could always call if you needed support from specialist units. Um, but one of the key things I wanted to do was, was kick some backsides, frankly, because many had been there for many years, far too long. And, and I felt they ought to be uh, uh, smarter, uh, fitter. I wanted to make everybody armed there for obvious reasons. I've been spending my l lifetime combating the IRA. And really, if you're going to put officers protecting strategic positions, you need to be armed in this day and age, because otherwise you're, you're open to all kinds of things, as we've seen and history teaches us, really. So I know there are things you can't talk about, Di, because it's still operationally sensitive. Well, but, I mean, obviously, we'd love to know some details of, you know, if the Queen or now, or now King Charles is travelling, he will have armed men within, what, 10 yards of him or closer? Well, each each journey is, is, is pre-thought out. It, it is, has a specific plan. Each event has its own planning stage. And yes, you will have armed officers wherever the king goes. And, and in women, my I day, guess. And women, and yes, uh, more women than in my day, um, certainly, and, and good thing, of course. But what I'm trying to say is, yes, each event, whether it's at home or abroad, there is a specific operation. And, you know, somebody like me, you really need to know your history. And I think I know a lot more of the history because one of the key things you study, and I went all over the world subsequently, uh, is how many people are attacked. And, and, you know, I now lecture, as you know, on the history of attacks on royalty. And that's where I should be writing my next book or my my first book. That's where the key is, because a lot of people have written about Victoria. Very few have taken it back to George III and then taken it forward to present day. And if you can write it from an open source uh, kind of system where it is historical fact and documented, there is no problem, as far as I'm concerned, and I've been doing this for 12 years now, 13 uh, on cruise ships and, and around the country giving lectures to people about the history. And I've got 10 now, believe it or not, 10 one-hour docu you know, documentaries or oh, wow. lectures, whatever you want to call them. And how many um, uh, uh, attempts were made, for example, on the Queen's life? Can you say that? Can you explain? Yes, I can. Um, well, I'd have to refer back, but I would say if you're looking at the plots uh, from an early uh, stage, uh, the provisional IRA, certainly going back into the 60s. And that's when it really started, as far as Her Majesty was concerned. They plotted in Belfast on several occasions. They put bombs here. They did it in Scotland, the only time when she was opening an oil terminal. And then quickly you could go all the way to the Commonwealth Conference in Uganda. You could see it in Australia. I could go on and on, to be honest with you. And, and some of it you obviously can't talk about. And as you know, Aspects of Northern Ireland are still covered under the Official Secrets Act. So, uh, but most of it is open source. That you, being the person you are and your colleague, you could look it up and you could do it to the same extent. It's, it's, I, it's a it's a funny way of saying phrasing it. But what's your sort of favourite attack in the sense it was cleverly stopped? Um, my favourite. Uh, well, I'm not sure I have a favourite attack, but one of the most embarrassing thing must have been Fagan. Uh, and although he potentially was, was just a burglar, uh, the sheer embarrassment that he got in not once but twice and actually got into Her Majesty's bedroom and, and scared her, as far as I, I'm aware. A lot of nonsense is talked about that, including when he changes his story. But the truth was, it was an astonishing attack. And again, Mountbatten, 
and clearly there are so many ins and outs to that one that uh, still I don't think has been properly examined because there are all kinds of potential theories, conspiracies there, as you well know. Um, and your own research is evidence of that. And I don't think still we've had the full truth as to what really went on. But it's a, that's, if you like, from a professional hit, has mm. to be one of the greatest ones, really. And, and the failure, the failure to actually do it properly. And, and that's what's always struck me. You know, you have all these so-called experts um, at Scotland Yard and other police forces, but they don't look outside the box. And I, I could... Bet you a hundred pounds. Most of them don't know the history of attacks, and, and I spent time in, in the United States, and of course the president there has been attacked. And if you look at any president, from Israelis to the Indians to Pakistan, it, you know they, it, it's something you should know, and you should know how it comes about. And I suspect well, most in a, in a public figure's life, and you mentioned presidents and royals, when are they most exposed? When they're going from uh, their homes or um, to a place where you've publicized. That's why I get angry sometimes with visits to New Zealand and others where they actually said to the minute, this is where they're going to be walking, this is the route they're going to take. That is nonsensical if you think your principle is, and I went on television and, and got slated, as you always do when you go on and say, open your mouth, but <laughs> I don't care. That's the way I, I want things done, as quietly and as efficiently as possible but don't tell them because there are people out there even today who for their nefarious reasons will want to attack our royals and other royals and it's not just our royals if you look at the history of attacks on royals both in portugal uh, in 1901 and so on and so forth you know as i say i could prattle away all day about the no it's fascinating I, this country. I, I i hadn't realized because maybe i just was out of the country or something there was quite a serious attack on charles and camilla not that long yes. ago. Well, in 2010, and again, when they went back to Mulligan Hall in Northern Ireland, or Southern Ireland, borderline, they were, there's a man being convicted there that he was planning to attack them. And again, I forgot his name, a guy was on the bus when the Queen had her historic. He went on the bus with guns and bombs on the bus. And he was intending to blow her up. And you go all the way to New Zealand where a chap called Lewis got hold of a 303 and was going to shoot the Queen. You can, I could go on and on. No, do so, I, are we moving to a position where actually we're going to have to give up on walkabouts and the royal family have got to be, you know, kept away because it's just too dangerous? No, is the answer. And they wouldn't either. Uh, very fatalistic. They have faith in those men and women that do surround them. They have faith. And really, protection is like an onion, really. You have rings and rings, some that you see overtly. And some you don't see. And again, you in, you rely on intelligence. And again, I won't go too much into that. But uh, intelligence is graded information. And the key is to make sure you have that graded information and that you apply it in your strategic thinking. And that's what's crucial. You know, uh, most, most coppers are not academics. They're not um, specialists. But what they do learn, the good ones, is that seat of the pants, that instinct. And that's where, if you're on the streets, where instinct is so important, I think, in day-to-day in -day protection. And, and again, I hate the word thinking outside the box, but I would say think the impossible and then think it again. Because believe me, the, the, the attempts that people do to get into Buckingham Palace, just as an example, are quite extraordinary. They fly in, they ram, they, they, they do all kinds of strange things to get access to. It's, it's like... A, a honeypot to people who are normally mentally ill, but of course you have that backdrop of the IRA, the provisional IRA, and Al Qaeda and others. I know so some fascinating. Of the royal family targeted more than others. I mean, presumably the Queen, Prince Philip, King Charles, but oh, were there certain yes. people? Yes, historically, it's normally the the sovereign and or some of her children. For instance, in Sydney, Prince Alfred was shot in the back by a so-called Fenian. He was mentally ill, but he got he shot him, and it was only his rubber braces that saved him, and that was in 1867 from memory. And he's the only guy who actually got hung for it. And it's very interesting, the guy who tried to take a crossbow or took a crossbow to the late Queen, you know, they tried him under an 1842 act uh, where you're causing harm or distress, which was brought in uh, by the second attack on Queen Victoria. And again, 
uh, maximum of seven years and a damn good thrashing. You know, we don't do the thrashing anymore. But I think he's mentally ill. I know the judge said when he plotted this, he wasn't. But he's severely mentally ill, I think. But that's just my opinion from what I've read. And most of them are. Now, some some royal people like the crowds. I mean, Diana famously would go a little bit off script and she would go into the crowd and she would yes. suddenly engage with people. Did that? Would that give you palpitations when that happened? Well, yes and no. In one sense, if you know she's going to do it, you can anticipate she's going to do it and put your officers in strategic position. The crux is watch the crowd, watch them and look for any sign. And I won't go into one or two when I went out. It wasn't my job to go out and physically do it, but it was certainly my job to review it and see how it was done when I did go out. And I can remember an occasion in Wales where they let a guy give her a bunch of flowers. Well, they didn't stop him and find out who he was. Well, he was somebody with IRA connections, and he got that close. And I could tell you lots more, but I'm not going to do it uh, in public. But it's fascinating, really. Hang on. Uh, yeah, so uh, an amazing job. And, and, and again, I've been around the world since retirement, advising in, in, in Jamaica, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, on how to tackle their gangsters, which was a great job. Um, and as far as Siberia, <laughs> that was an interesting one. Um, so, yes, it's never, it's not dull and it continues not to be dull because I, I love history and I love talking to my learned author friend here. Well, Andrew, and, as and you know, the... Andrew is writing a book on another Andrew, Prince Andrew. Well, uh, yes, he and his... I are quite interested in that. Well, his travels, of course, are very controversial because he was traveling sometimes with people who he didn't want the rest of the world to know about to have meetings that even now are kind of secret. Or was it trade? Was it Epstein related? What was going on? Would your guys have been with him and your women? Would they have been with him on those trips? Yes, yes, that certainly. Until very recently, they would have been with him on all his trips. And Andrew and I have discussed this, and that's why I, I said publicly, and Andrew is aware of this. Why weren't they interviewed with regards to this famous, you know, uh, muse where he's alleged to have sex with this young lady? Uh, I, I helped Panorama uh, with their program and Channel 4, not because I got anything against him personally. It's just I don't like anyone being treated differently um, to the rest of us. And, and I feel for whatever reason, and again, I think it was two or three days after his interview, I did go on Newsnight. I did lambast the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and I will continue to do so but without fear or favor because nobody's explained to me why, if you've got credible evidence, and it's the same with Bashir, if you have credible evidence, why you don't go and pursue it? Because if you don't, if you don't question people, you won't find any evidence. And in both cases, they seem to me to be a prima facie case to actually go and, and question. And that's been evidence ever since. And, and their failure to give a proper answer to Andrew in his uh, quest for information is indicative to me uh, of they've got something to hide. Mm. And where do you think the pressure comes from? I mean, it's not members of the royal household, is it? it it's just an almost a self-imposed deference by the Metropolitan Police or Whitehall or whatever. I honestly don't know, but I think there is this deference at the highest levels of government in some levels of society who have influence. And it it, it comes back to <laughs> weak commissioners. And, and there's been a history of weak commissioners. I certainly in the last 10 years or more. Um, you, you know, uh, and I think that has something to do with it, whether it's because they want their lordship and whether they want the, the status. And of course, nobody wants to tackle, uh, the royals, the king in Turton. And again, as you well know, Tom Bauer is another one without fear or favor will evidence all manner of things. Now, I, I'm not a judge and jury, but equally, if you read some of his documentation about our learned king and his learned queen, you, you would be aghast. Um, but most people don't know these things. I have a healthy cynicism that um, they do interfere and can interfere if if it affects the status. And again, with the Burrell trial, uh, the fact that Her Majesty suddenly remembered a conversation from five years that woman was the best informed uh, woman in the country every morning she and i had a briefing of anything that affected the royal family in the press so the fact that nobody knew about this is nonsensical 
and we are where we are, and I don't want to talk ill of anyone. But that was nonsensical, and of course that stopped the trial. Boom. And what's pressure put on, do you think, uh, protection officers not to speak out? I mean, someone said to me that, you know, they said if they spoke out, they could be back on the beat in Brixton. Um, that wouldn't have happened in your time, but is that sort of what's happening now? Well, nothing wrong with being on the beat in Brixton. And what a great place to walk the beat if anybody ever does these days. I'm not sure they do. Uh, no, I, I, I've never encountered that in royalty protection. I've encountered it as a divisional commander when we were investigating at a very high level society when we were ordered to stop uh, investigating this individual. And that came from the deputy commissioner then. Uh, I won't go into detail, but it left a horrible stink. And I wasn't brave enough as a young up and coming superintendent to challenge it. I certainly would have now. And do you think there are more mechanisms to do that now? Oh, I hope so. There has to be. You, the Met can't get, carry on in the way it has been. But, it, you know, leadership is a crucial, it's a, it's a factor. And if you have strong, firm leadership, the men nor and women will normally follow in line. But you have to have a culture of excellence. You know, I, I sometimes lecture, I have lectured at Cardiff University on ethical leadership. And ethical leadership, I define as knowing what is right and then having the courage to do what is right. And so sadly in society, so few of us have that courage or the opportunity to actually do it. And that's what's wrong with so much in society. The ethical leadership in this country is woe, in my well, opinion. It sounds from what you're saying, Di, that you feel that criticism applies to well, everything around Prince Andrew, the policing of him, the investigation of him, there's a, a lack of courage perhaps in the people that really know wh where he went and what he did to speak out and cause trouble. I mean, do you think that's what's happened? Well, I honestly don't know. You should, if you haven't seen it, you should see my an interview with uh, the news night, uh, with the young lady that interviewed him, and you will see. Uh, days afterwards, I'm fairly direct, uh, and I'm asking the question. Now, again, we don't know. I don't know. Did they pursue it in any way? But uh, if I recall, uh, three times they've been asked to investigate it, and again with Bashir. Uh, I gave a lecture in, 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 in near London, and, and there were judges in the audience and barristers. And the question afterwards I was asked is, what do you think? And I said, it's, I think it stinks. I think the BBC it must be the only organisation who can get a, a judge to investigate themselves. It costs millions of taxpayers' money, and we still haven't got the answers. Uh, you know, I think Mr Bashir should at least have been, in, you know, questioned, and, and others take and statements taken. You see, the difference is, in my day, you got your evidence first, then you arrested. Nowadays, they seem to arrest and then think they can go fishing. That's wrong. And that applies to journalists and others. It is totally wrong that it takes years for these various bodies, the uh, IOPC, when they're investigating police officers who pulled a gun and shot people, the Crown Prosecution. I've investigated complex cases. It would take me about six to eight weeks maximum. I simply don't understand, if you're professional, why it takes all this time to investigate anything. It, it beggars belief, frankly. And then we have to have public inquiries, and they go on for years and achieve very, very little. And, uh, do you think there have been other cover-ups that haven't gone public, I mean, about uh, members of the royal family or other stories? Oh, um, you... Yes, I think so. If you actually look at some of their behaviour over the years, who they've mixed with, who they've taken money from, it's screaming out for somebody to actually articulate it in a sensible, structured way. I mean, if any of the rest of us cohorted with people like Jimmy Savile and others, unknowingly perhaps, but it says something about your intelligence. And, and going back to Edward VIII, where was the intelligence where he got married in, in, in Chateau uh, Candy by a, a known German sympathizer and allegedly spy? Where was our intelligence then? And I go back to the boat people, you know, why aren't we putting our combined intelligence into tracking these people? You know, we know the boats come from Turkey, cross land. We know outboard engines. They're being produced at a, an incredible rate. Why don't we go and make them an offer they can't refuse? Well, just, just, just beg us to... Just beg us belief. Sure, I just... Beg us belief. 
I'm really interested in what you just said, though, about cases being dropped. I mean, it was only a few months ago, I think it was in August this year, the famous cash for honor story around um, King yes. Charles as he is, Prince of Wales as he was, Michael Fawcett, the bag man, the fixer, suggestions of yes. lots of money moving about for access, perhaps for honors, perhaps yes. some, somebody could. That's just disappeared. I mean, and it, it disappeared around the same time he became king. And I, I have to say, that really does look pretty smelly. What do you think about that story? Do you have any special knowledge about that? No, I don't have any more knowledge than you or anyone else. But again, the Met took months and months to investigate that. As I understand it, nobody was uh, interviewed under caution even. Well, I go back to Princess Diana and the fact that she allegedly took statements from uh, various people, including a uh, chap called Brown uh, and another who died, you know. And the fact is that um, some of these allegations are very, very serious, but they are kicked sometimes into the long grass. And, and so it'll be very interesting. But I don't think anybody has the courage to do it. And is there a a position to make change? I mean, could politicians do it? Um, Or does it need to come from within the royal household? Or does it need, as you say, strong leadership from the police service itself? Well, I think it's a combination. And and again, um, Norman Baker, whatever you think about his politics, the one thing that man has is the courage to say what he thinks and he evidences. And his book is a, a, a testimony to that. Now, that's so rare. Tina Brown and others do it, but nothing ever seems to happen. And I think while the BBC and other news organisations are rewarded with knighthoods, they're rewarded by lordship, I don't think you're ever going to get it. Uh, It's the structure of our country as we are, which is hierarchical and still is in many ways. So, you know, I'm not a screaming lefty. I'm quite right if, if I'm anything, but I believe in justice. And and but and then I say to myself, well, who the hell do you think you are? Well, I just a ex copper who has a view. Interesting, though. Well, and so, more than a little depressing, to be honest. Well, I don't so get depressed. No, I can't wait to wake up because there's always something new to discover. Fair enough. Something new to investigate. Oh, good lord, no! If we didn't have all this nonsense going on, what would people like me and 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 uh, Andrew do all day? And what point. did you most enjoy about your time uh, in the protection, dealing with royal protection? That's a very good question. Um, I had, by the time I finished, I had extremely high blood pressure. Um, it went through the roof. I, I, I was also chairman of London and the city's um, chief superintendents and superintendents association and national. Um, what was my best moment? I think shaping them, if you like, into a far more effective intelligence led uh, outfit where everybody was coming in had to be armed, uh, creating a fitness regime, but creating an intelligence structure that hopefully when we went abroad, it was better. And that we had this index of fixated persons and things. I thought that was tremendously important. Uh, by and large, uh, I liked the people I worked with, some more than others, as you do in any large organization. Um, but it gave me a, a platform, if you like, to do what I'm doing now and, and travel the world and, and do some very interesting aspects of policing and advice from the Middle East to 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 Hong Kong. You name it. I've been there and advising on a wide variety. And that, that's what's exciting, really. And even at my age now, I can't wait to wake up because the phone goes and I'm on some program or other. And, and lambasting anyone, you know, who I think is wrong. So who was your favourite really... royal person to work for? Which was the one you enjoyed well, working I did, with I, the most? I, I worked for them all, if you like. So I, I had uh, Diana, I, I met her, at, I was giving a leaving speech. For, uh, I'd only been there a month and there was quite a big audience. And of course, you're being tested, aren't you? And I have to give a leaving speech. And she was stood at the back. And afterwards, I finished, I was introduced, the first time I was introduced to her. And she said, Mr. Davis, do you know what you've taken on? I said, no, ma'am, I probably don't. And she looked at me very wisely because the war was going on. But I liked her as a human being. I thought she was a very attractive woman. And she said some nice things about my ability to articulate, which I've always, uh, you know, thought about. And it was a nice thing to say and certainly did my ego a great deal of good. And and the speech went down very well because I'm a bit of a comedian as well, which you haven't seen yet. 
But uh, if and you what, get to know me, I'm a comedian too. We'll have to come have you back as a comedian. But what um, do, do you feel worried that the security may be taken away from people like Andrew or Harry, or indeed was taken away from Diana? I mean, the reason she yes. died was she was in the hands of people who were not professionals like you. Well, the reason she died was a drunken driver, as you well know. Uh, and again, if she'd been protected by royalty protection officers, it would never have happened. He wouldn't have been allowed to drive at such speed and, and perhaps the planning. But of course, they were under the auspices of uh, Mohammed Fayed themselves. And what he said went. And you wouldn't dare argue. Whereas from sergeant upwards, uh, you know, my officers were given carte blanche. If that's what they thought was right, that's what they did. They didn't. Only twice in the four years did anybody come back to me and say, what do you think? And it was in Aberystwyth where I think there was a student prank. They were going to sort of semi-capture the Queen. Uh, it was a student prank and nothing more. But we stopped that visit, I think, or I advised the then superintendent. He had my full backing. Um, and so stuff like that. Yeah, but no uh, is the answer. I, I don't. So I, I asked you who your favourite royal was. Oh, sorry. There's um, a very yeah, obvious well, follow-up. When you said Diana, which is great, um, I think she would have been mine too. So I have to ask the very obvious follow-up, if you can say who was one you didn't, you least enjoyed working for. Well, I'll give you three guesses. Uh, I didn't actually work for him, but again, he was one of the 22. Um, and I think Andrew uh, has to take prime mark as with the rest of the country. Uh, he can't be quite as obnoxious as we all think. But from what I've seen, he is. Well, that's certainly what I'm discovering in in my book too. I'm just amazed at how many people you had under your command. Because I mean, how many? Uh, uh, people I would have guessed fifty, to... not five hundred. That's amazing. Well, it's about four fifty with civilian staff as well. But of course, you bring in others. You know, if you get a, a breach into Kensington, then you've got the whole of the Met, their dog section, who I particularly like. I had uh, as part of my command once. I had nearly 40 police dogs, I think, and horses. And I think the animals, I prefer them to some of the humans on top of them. But um, <laughs> seriously, um, yeah, no, you had a huge uh, resource. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do was bring the expertise of some of them back into those offices. Because if you think about it, guarding and standing by a gate is not exactly stimulating so you've got to try and look at ways you can motivate and actually make it an attractive. One of the things I did do was say you can only come for five or seven years maximum. And I thought, go back to being a real cop and then come back and get promoted or you've shown you're a real cop. Because I think you need real coppers doing that job. You need them fit. You need them able to use a firearm and you need to have them savvy. And with great respect to some, some had been there far too long, in my opinion. Uh, they'd been allowed to look scruffy, overweight, and so on and so forth. I was a marathon runner, so I wasn't asking any, and a former firearms officer. Um, so I wasn't asking anyone to do what I wasn't as a relatively young man myself. <laughs> but, um, it, it wasn't popular with everyone. But when you took on the job, do you think actually that they may have been quite vulnerable because the officers weren't really fit and uh, uh, alert? Yes. Well, you'd, you'd think by 1990, whatever, the, the IRA had been attacking us since 1972 from memory. You'd think that that common sense would have said that's what you want. You'd think that you'd have the best technical support you have. And again, we didn't. And I thought, why? These people have been awarded with you know, CBEs and knighthoods and all kinds of things. And yet nobody, uh, perhaps it's just me. I just, perhaps it's just the way I think. But I, I, as I say, you know, if I see it, I'll say it and I'll sort it, as they say I did. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, we're, running, we're running very short of time, but um, it's such a pleasure to meet you. We should have you back for your comedy act. Well, so, please do. I've got some very good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, we should probably also thank you on behalf, maybe, of all the old things that could have happened that didn't happen because you smartened the outfit. Well, I hope so. I, I, you have to be modest about these things and, and no. to, take yourself no, you too don't. seriously. On behalf of a grateful nation, thank you. Well, well I think I'll, people were jolly lucky that we had someone like you doing it because, you know, I suppose it's 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 only just needs one mistake and, and that, that's history changed, really. Indeed. Well, you're right. And I actually met Patrick McGee, who did the bombing. And, and there's a very good book about it, a Killing Thatcher, if you've ever seen it. And, and, right. and again, I, 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 I met him and, and I said, I'd have shot you. And he said, I'd have shot you too. 
but I would have shot him. Um, and I shoot quite a few more even today, you know. I, I think we're so tolerant in this country. And I, you know, these, these people who support terrorism, whether it's in political parties or others, I don't know. I do. <laughs> They're lucky I'm not in charge. Well, before you make any explicit death threats, we have to go. But very, very good to talk to you. Great. And, and thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you for, the thank you for all your support yeah. for me. Because, I mean, Di has been wonderfully helpful in, in, in what I've been trying to do. So um, I'm really grateful. And, and it was right. a, that's a great interview. Fascinating new Fascinating. insight. And as the Americans say, thank you for your service, sir. Well, uh, my pleasure. And and. Perhaps I'll take advice from from both of you how I write this book. Oh, yes, happy to do that. We're very. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, well, thank you both. Take care. Thanks a lot, thank and you. good luck with the with the leg. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 